Thank you everyone for having me. Very much appreciate you spending your Tuesday wintry night out at Chai Hack Night. Um, wanted to tell you a little bit about me as we get started here. Uh, my name is Alina Agarwal, pronouns are she, hers. Um, I am a Chicago born and raised individual. Um, I spent some years in the private sector, uh, focusing on implementation and operations. Took a hard look in the mirror one day and then quit everything I was doing to pivot into the nonprofit sector. Uh, at the nonprofit sector, I really focused in on economic development. Um, and that's also actually the same time that I found Shy Hack Night for the very first time. So I started doing work in workforce development at an organization called Kara Chicago. Grew them into the Kara Collective, uh, so expanded them nationally, and really focused on how we help individuals get and keep jobs. And while I was doing that, I was coming to Shy Hack Night, sitting in chairs similar to these uh, at, uh, what was it, Merchandise Mart, and bugging Derek, asking him how I can get started on an app that helps uh, individuals across the city of Chicago close that unemployment gap. That failed entirely, um, but it was an incredibly useful experience to understand the power of tech. Recently, about a year or so ago, I transitioned to P33 Chicago, which I'll tell you about in just a second. Um, but it's an organization that focuses on what tech means for the city of Chicago. So the, uh, the, entire, the entire purpose, you could say, of P33 is to boost the tech innovative ecosystem of Chicago. And I was mentioning this to someone right outside, and the first question was like, that's great. What does that mean? Uh, which is a perfectly valid question. Um, and really it comes down to the idea that Chicago's got all of these great things. We've got tons of money, brilliant talent, um, great entrepreneurial scenes, we've got VCs, we've got um, fantastic universities all over the place. And yet, when somebody says, huh, what's the, the place to be for tech? They say Silicon Valley or they say New York City, or Austin, Texas. And for some reason, Chicago never makes that list. And so, what, about two years ago or so, a bunch of business leaders in the city of Chicago got together and said, that's not right. What can we do to fix that so we can put our city on the map and really gear it up for economic success in the future? And so P33 was born. There's about 15 of us working hard at figuring this out. And what the organization is looking at now is kind of three ways in which we want to enact change. One is founders. So Chicago's known as a great place to start a business, but a particularly difficult place to grow a business. And that problem amplifies a million fold if you're a black or Latinx founder. We've created a, a whole initiative called TechRise, which is a pitch competition that I'm happy to talk more about that helps kind of right the scale so that more dollars are flowing to idea stage founders and pre-seed founders in that category in this city. The second kind of pillar that we look at is talent. Um, that's the one that I'm gonna dive in a little bit more today and that's what our report was about. And then the third one are kind of regional priorities. So. Um, if you've heard, like electric vehicles are really on the map for the state of Illinois. That's something that we dabble in a little bit. Quantum is another thing that we dabble in. Just different things that we think can put Chicago on the map and give us a right to win before it explodes so that we're right at the precipice of it. And I'll dive into talent a little bit. So what we are seeking is that Chicago's companies should be thrilled to be here because of the access to tech talent that they have and also we need to make sure that that tech talent is reflective of the demography of the city of Chicago. And spoiler alert, today it is not. So that's something that we really need to fix. And to be fair, not any city is really hitting the mark on that. But we think Chicago, with the brilliant talent that it's got, the great universities and the infrastructure we have, would be able to win this game. And so this is a very rough illustration of what the entire ecosystem looks like. Um, it's kind of hard to see, let's see. Um, so we've got startups over here. We've got kind of corporations, academic institutions that are kind of split between top tier and non-top tier. Nonprofit institutions, of which some focus on entry level tech talent, and then boot camps and certificate programs. In today's world, there's some connections among these. And that's good, because connections means that there's a flow of talent. 
So people who get trained up from schools end up at these corporations. Oftentimes, startups poach from these corporations, and that's how talent flows. Um, there's some connection to nonprofits, some connection to boot camps and certificates, but these tend to be on a 1Z, 2Z relationship-based thing. It's not always a giant flow. It's more of a trickle and a because somebody happens to know somebody else, somebody gets a job. What we want it to look like is a hot mess of craziness where there's tons of relationships, uh, new ones all over the place, and really deep relationships. So it doesn't just hinge on one person, but that it is institutionalized. That if you get an education from here or if you go to this boot camp here, you have access to all of the jobs that are out there. The way that we go about doing this is a little bit different than how others do. So often what you end up with are training programs that create this supply of talent and they go out and try to make relationships um, to, with the demand side so that you can send somebody over, somebody gets a job, but it's again on that 1Z, 2Z relationship. So what P33 did is kind of flip that equation on its head. Let, we said, let's start with that demand side see what we can learn from them, build some solutions that solve their needs, and plug in the existing supply so that we make a more equitable system overall. And what you can see on the screen here are 38, actually this is now 39 companies that form what we call our Tech Talent Coalition. It's a group of CTOs and CHROs who come together all across the industry, right? We've got Fortune 500, we've got venture back startup, um, and we've got you know, all sorts of industries represented here. You see KPMG, you see Google, you see Cognizant, you see M1, you see Morningstar, right, all, all over the map. The one thing that ties them together is that everybody has said, I wanna lean in and do things different. And that energy, that excitement, is what we need in order to change the game for the city. This is an example of kind of how we work with them. That group has been together about a year now. And when we first got together, we did a lot of blue sky thinking of what are the issues that you have? How do we solve them? And what is it that we do to make this ecosystem work better? And effectively, this iterative process is what we went through. Today, we came up with a couple solutions and I'll talk through them a little bit later. But the idea is that all of this is demand driven, i.e. market driven, and thus should have legs to stand on its own. And there's kind of three things that we've come up with so far. And I'll start with kind of the problems that they shared. They effectively mentioned that they have a really difficult time attracting talent. So when they think of their experienced hires, um, oftentimes these companies will think of people who happen to be on either of the coasts. And then they reach out, they throw a bunch of tricks at them to try to get them to come over to Chicago. And sometimes they succeed in that and sometimes they don't. But it's a very kind of happenstance kind of relationship. And so attracting that talent to the city of Chicago has proven really difficult. And for that, we've, we've launched something called Tech Chicago. Uh, we're trying to get the brand out there because we recognize there's a lot happening in the city and people outside the city, sometimes people in the city don't know about it. So if we can tell that story a little bit better, we might succeed. The other part of this is that the workforce ready entry level graduates are really difficult for these companies to get. And for that reason, we've got Tech Pass and we've got Strong Start. And I'll, I'll dive into those a little bit more later. But in doing all of this work, what we recognize is that, you know, that map I showed you of all the different stakeholders, everybody wants to know what is it that these employers need. It's kind of demystifying that demand side of the equation that people kept coming to us for, and we realized there's honestly a dearth of information out there. Often you'll see you know, those giant BLS reports or Burning Glass or LinkedIn reports, and they're, they're great. There's tons of valuable data there. And at the same time, it's really difficult to localize any of that. Right? It talks about things at such a wide scale that you don't quite know what to do if you're a program in the city or if you're an academic institution within the city wanting to do things different. Uh, and so we said, all right, let's, let's write it all up so that people have access to it. And that's the report that I'm here to talk about today. I'll give you a brief overview. Um, effectively, we call it the state of Chicago tech talent because we think that specificity really makes us actionable rather than just a kind of survey of what's going on. 
And the crux of this, right, is, you know, oftentimes people talk about tech as this great equalizer. Like, all the ills of society will be solved and the structural racism and everything else that's going on will be solved by this magic silver bullet of tech. And what we argue is that's not necessarily true, right? It could be, but we have to change ourselves to make it such. Otherwise, tech just becomes another industry that exacerbates the same inequalities that Chicago has had and will continue to have unless we change our behavior. So the very first thing that this report goes into is that demand for tech talent is skyrocketing. It's growing. Tech very much is the future. We'll dive into a little bit of specifics around that. The second component of this, uh, which I don't think is surprising to anyone, um, but access to these jobs is unequal. It's not evenly distributed. Opportunity very much varies based on what names you have on your resume, how you present yourself, um, all of these sorts of factors. And then third, employers need to change the way that they do things to help develop talent. And I'll, I'll dive into that one as well. All right, first, on this y-axis, you've got the average salary of an entry-level role in these positions. On the x-axis, it's increasing demand. The bigger the circle means the larger the, the larger the growth. So if you can see, software engineering is this big circle over here, data and analytics is this big one here. And that's fantastic, because 90% of companies expect an increase in these roles over the next three years. So if someone says, hey, Alina, where, where is Chicago Tech growing? That's where. There's other things in here too, right? So there's network and systems admin, there's tech support, and these, are, these aren't bad salaries. They're at 60K, 80K, um, but they're not growing as much. Often, not often, sometimes, the tech training programs that we have aim for roles like this, which isn't bad, right? Because we need tech support and we need these roles. And they don't always aim for roles like this. And so if that's where the growth is going to happen in the city of Chicago, that's where we argue those roles are the ones that we need to fill. All that said, we know that filling those roles isn't an equal task. I'm going to read these numbers to you. I know that you can all read. They are just that striking. 14% of the tech jobs in this city are held by somebody who was black or Latinx. And yet, the city of Chicago is over 50% black and Latinx. Illinois, the entire state, graduated 19 females in computer science who are black. 19 in one year for the entire state. That is absurd. And, and that was better than the years before it. On top of that, we estimate that Illinois is losing 600 black and Latinx bachelor degree students every year in computing. So we pulled the numbers and we looked at, our, like, where is the drop-off happening? And we realized for black and Latinx students in the state of Illinois in particular, there's almost a 75% drop-off from freshman year to junior year in college. And what that means is that way before somebody even has a shot at an internship or a future job, people, kids are saying that tech or STEM isn't for them. Yeah, so these come from um, IBAG, so Illinois Board of Higher Ed, um, along with a couple other reports. So the ISTC also has a bunch of these numbers in their reports. They just published a new one recently. Um, but they are publicly available. I think what's hard about them is aggregating them in such a way that they become useful for us. And so you'll hear often people say, right, like it's a pipeline issue. Like, I would hire more black or Latinx individuals if I saw more black and Latinx individuals. Um, and that, that's not entirely wrong, but it's also not entirely right. And that's the part that I kind of want to emphasize here. There are fewer black and Latinx and women who are graduating in these programs. And also, it is up to the companies to help do something about that so that these pipelines don't block us indefinitely. We dove in a little bit to figure out why exactly this is happening. We spent, what, um, last year in the winter, individually, by hand, matching students to summer internship opportunities to figure out, all right, if I put this resume of somebody coming from a non-top tier school or from this nonprofit program 
in front of a company that's telling me that they're interested in these students, it should work, right? You've got people clamoring on both sides for the same opportunity. It should work out just fine. And what we learned is it didn't. And it's hard in these circumstances to put the blame on anything, but I think what kept coming up over and over again was that folks would look at these resumes and say that students don't have the right skills, the right experience, or the ability to talk about what they've done. And I think that's incredibly important, right? They're not necessarily looking at a resume and throwing it out because of the university, um, but they are saying, all right, where are those two bullet points that tell me something about what this student has accomplished, whether it was in school or on their own or at Chai Hack Night? What is it that they can communicate about that? And what this tells us is that the days of the lone coder sitting in a corner are kind of gone. Like when these companies look for tech talent, they look for somebody who can speak in front of a room, talk about a project, communicate with a team. And all of those aspects are what they look for right from the get-go. So what this is showing you are the skills that were listed as prerequisites for getting these data analytic jobs on the left-hand side and the software engineering jobs on the right-hand side. So this top one here is SQL database and structures, mostly listed as a prerequisite, um, with some folks saying it's a nice to have. And the corollary for software engineering is Java listed as a prerequisite, and like 46% of people saying it's a nice to have. So on the right, it's Java, JavaScript, HTML, Python, C++. On the left, it's SQL, Python, DataViz, uh, VBA or Excel, and R. And this is important because what we learned, particularly for internships, is that sometimes companies were looking for skills that students hadn't yet learned. That, like, that was a senior level class that they would take in the future. But in order to get a junior level internship, they would be effectively sh out of luck. We also know that companies can act a little bit different. It's not just a pipeline problem. It's also a problem of what's happening in companies, right? It's one thing to hire individuals. It's another to make sure you have a great environment where people are excited to stay. For that reason, and we know companies have increased their focus on DEI over the years, particularly after George Floyd's murder. And we also know that businesses can't sit back and just wait for the perfect unicorn candidate to knock on their door junior or senior year, so hope to sweep them up and then be in, be ready to hit the races. If there's such few candidates who are actually making it all the way through the pipeline, it turns into a feeding frenzy where all of the companies in the city of Chicago are battling for that same handful of individuals. So instead of playing that zero sum game, what we propose is changing it up and recognizing there are ways that many people can win and that all of these companies can do a better job by helping the students right from the get-go. So not only can they source talent from wider networks, um, they can change their hiring and screening practices so that more of these students make it through the ATS, do work on their internal culture so that it's a more hospitable environment, and honestly use data to recognize where they're uh, failing to fill these gaps. There's a couple solutions that we have put into place to try to solve this a little bit ourselves. And that said, this is a huge problem that requires tons of different organizations to help with. There are great organizations out there who are helping. World Business Chicago has some stuff. DPI is doing some great work. Get Cities is doing great work. Um, and here are two kind of pilot initiatives that we've put into place. The first one is called Tech Pass. And what it does is help students realize that they don't often know where to go for a tech career. If they happen to know somebody who can tap them on the shoulder, like an older cousin or a brother or an uncle, who can say, hey, this is, this is what you should be doing your junior year or your sophomore year, that's great, that's fantastic. But the way that our system is set up, not everybody has access to that. And in those circumstances, they often don't know what to do. And so we built TechPass, an app that gives a personalized roadmap for those students to understand how to get a career in tech. And on the other side of that platform, we've got companies who are really interested in hiring diverse talent on the lookout for them. So they can see kind of the hunger of these students and start to evaluate them in that way rather than just relying on a resume. So that's TechPass. Strong Start 
is another initiative that we started this fall, and it's focused on bringing companies into the freshman classroom so that students experience the reality of tech right from the get-go. And this is the idea that tech isn't a subject where if you lean down and look at a textbook and memorize every algorithm that you're just gonna ace and magically get a job at the end of. Tech has a lot of lingo, it has a lot of like GitHub, things that you don't learn until you actually dig into it yourself. And so what Strong Start does is strip out components of the class that every student needs to take, like CS100, and instead put in projects that companies lead so that students get access to these individuals, get access to these mentors, and start to see what a reality of tech looks like. We just ran this one. Um, IAT and M1 were paired up for a class this semester, and then G2 and PWC were paired up with UIC. And so far, we're seeing some really good results of these relationships starting. I'm gonna pause there. I am happy to go into deeper detail on any of these things, whether it be the report or either of the solutions that I've got up on the screen here. Um, but are there any questions that folks have? I'm curious, I know one of the pushbacks that I've heard on this kind of thing from universities tends to be like, they see themselves as like, we're not you know, responsible for getting people ready for like a job, like we're supposed to be like a place of learning or, or whatever. Um, I'm just, I'm curious if that is something you guys have had to deal with, and if so, how? Yeah, um, great question. I will share my personal point of view, which is that, what's the point of learning if you can't support yourself? Uh, again, Alina's point of view on that, but what we've learned is that universities that do really care about this, that recognize the problems that they, they face and that their students face, have put a tremendous amount of effort in making sure that their students get jobs, get the real life exposure, and are set up for success as best as possible. Not every classroom works that way, um, and for that reason, those are the classrooms that we're not in yet, and that's all right. Um, the, not every single learning experience needs to be work-based learning, um, but as long as students get some exposure to that at the very beginning of their experience, we're hoping that that retains them in STEM and shows them how cool a career in that can be. And I'll add, like, IIT and UIC have been incredible partners in this, and they've very much been pushing the envelope, even for us, to think about new ways of doing this. Hi, thanks. Um, what's the mix of companies that are you seeing participating? You mentioned some startups, mature startups, established companies. Could you talk about that? Uh, in the Tech Talent Coalition? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll just throw this slide up there. Um, it, it's honestly all over the map. And what we look for are companies that recognize it's not just a tech solution and it's also not just an HR solution, that it requires the coordination of both of those things and all company motivation to lead in and do things a little bit different. Oftentimes when I, when I share the idea that, you know, 19 black female grads in tech, or in computer science rather, in the state of Illinois, we have to do something about that. Every single one of these members says, yes, absolutely, we do. Like, not only is this not good for my company, this isn't good for the city of Chicago, and it's certainly not good for our residents. Hi, uh, you cited a stat that 75% of people who started uh, pursuing a degree in STEM ended up dropping. I was curious, did they totally drop out of school or switch to something else? Switch to something else. And what did they switch to? Uh, you know, I don't know. And do you know why? Is it, is, it, <laughs> is it understood like the reasons that people switched out? Yeah, these are fantastic questions. Um, this also points to how hard it is to get data on this stuff. Uh, is really widespread. So even pulling that 75% drop-off rate was a struggle for our team, but it was really important to kind of piece all those bits of information together to get a cohesive story. So often what we hear, um, and I can't assign percentages to it because I don't quite know, but the idea is that a lack of belonging plays a really deep role in this. Um, a lack of feeling, and this is particularly for women um, and people of color, that not seeing somebody like yourself in tech is a huge detriment to your own ability to go through it. Um, anecdotally, I've also heard that sometimes career guidance pushes you out of those roles and pushes you into things like math, where you might have an interest in numbers, but perhaps that course load is easier, and so you might go in that direction. 
Um, and also, like, perhaps some people don't know what it is yet, right? Lack of exposure to what tech actually is means that perhaps your very first experience with it shows you it's not what I really want to do. Yeah, hi. Um, I say that you're focusing a lot on undergrads. Is there any other um, pathways in that you're thinking about, like career changers? I mean, as someone who's been in the middle of a career change <laughs> like for the last few years, is there's a not... I don't know. I'm saying I, I found that it kind of be frustrating when a lot of the culture is just for young, upstart, pretty much white man who has all the time in the world. Like that is their ideal employee. So even with like, as a person who's been to so many presentations by boot camps and all these um, businesses, they're looking to attract people who switching into tech. They, they still perpetuate a lot of times that same culture of like, you got to be here 16 hours a day and that's what everyone wants. And that just excludes anyone with any caregiving responsibilities, disabilities, you know, a whole sector of people. Um, so that's, I was wondering if you had like in the future, because I know undergrads are like a good place to start because they're all like gathered together. But um, yeah, I, that's a great point. Um, and that culture is pervasive. For sure. And that's part of the reason that we say this is a company problem. This is very much um, a situation where it's not just about getting people in, but creating environments where they want to stay. The reason that we start with undergrad very much is what you're suggesting. If you imagine like a leaky pipeline of people interested in tech all the way to people finally working in tech, there's a bunch of different off branches there, right? A lot of different exits that occur. If the very last step of what should work, air quotes, um, of a traditional four-year path into a job in tech, if that in and of itself is broken, the way that we look at it is nothing else can work. That said, we know that there's tons of great opportunity out there with alternative pathways, whether that's going through city colleges or going through uh, a boot camp experience. And some of the work that we're going to work on come January and will likely take over my life for the spring is determining what we can do to make those pathways more acceptable to employers. Right? So anecdotally, we'll ask about them today and they'll say, yeah, like that, that's a thing we tried it once or twice. Maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. Or this one person has a great relationship with this one boot camp and so that, that flow works well. But other than that, eh, well, if it happens, it happens. Instead, we need to recognize that if we think about diversity in tech, whether it's race, gender, um, any other type of diversity, most of those individuals aren't necessarily coming through that traditional four-year pipeline. And so if we're talking about actually doing something to change these numbers, we've got to broaden our perspective. Um, and in order to do that, we've got to start seeing those alternative pathways as viable pathways into tech. And right now, I don't know if that's the case. That's where we're going to dive in next. Um, I think anecdotally it seems to happen here and there, which is great. But if it doesn't happen systemically, we're not really helping the, the overall group of people. Um, and I will plug the MOM project. They do some fantastic research as well as uh, work specifically on helping. Um, this is mothers who have left the workforce who are coming back into tech um, because they've got great work there. Um, this is kind of a question slash comment that I would be interested in hearing you speak to um, kind of along those lines too is like as a I'm a person who went to undergrad as a first generation college student but then taught myself how to code and I feel like that's a, a path that was largely seen as possible for me because of my privilege and because of like coming to events like Shy Hack Night and just seeing people doing it and kind of exposure to the career and so I wonder if like some of the research kind of shows whether there's this like not only like cultural gap like once you get in the position but even like looking from the outside I think there's this perception that like everything we do is wizardry and you have to have somebody else tell you how to do it and then I now that I work in the industry like know so many people like myself who just kind of like tell themselves how to do it and like so it's like seeing that that's possible something that you know differs along like racial or other demographic lines. Yeah, I mean, I think I, it does come down to privilege a lot of times, right? So in order to teach yourself how to do something outside of school, you need time outside of school, which means you can't have two jobs that are helping you go through school at that same time. Not saying that's your case, but in general. That said, 
it's that mentality of like, you can figure it out. There are really cool ways to get into tech. And quite honestly, it's a lot of fun. And if you can get somebody hooked on that, and if you can make that part of their learning journey, that's an amazing thing that pretty much every recruiter I know is thrilled to hear about. How you translate that into the two bullet points of experience that they're looking for that give them validity in the eyes of that individual, that's the trick. And that's where we're hoping, like with Strong Start in particular, having work-based learning opportunities. So saying, hey, I did a project with M1, not just something on my own, which is hard to prove how technically savvy I am, but rather with somebody who is well known and has a lot of credibility in the space, that hopefully starts to change the game. So that those statistics about the state universities having such abysmal numbers, like have they like what's their like what's their reaction been? And also like it, what are the consequences? Like are is like shouldn't someone be like fired or otherwise like reprimanded for such like abysmal performance? Is Great. that I mean it seems like if anything's going to happen, like a consequences need to be put in place. Is that yeah. Is that something you thought about? <laughs> that is something I've thought about. That is not something I'm in the power to enact. Um, but I will say the universities recognize it too, right? They're trying to fix these problems themselves. They recognize that, um, what, 20% of this, or no, probably 80% of their students in computer science, depending on which university you look at, are white and Asian, and that only contributes to the discrepancies that they see. I think that the universities that truly are trying new programs and doing things differently are showing how much they care about it based on how willing they are to do things differently. I don't think anybody's happy with the current situation, I'll be totally honest. Um, but it's also, you know, this whole ecosystem map that I showed you, it's not any one person's fault. It's not any one person that I can point to and say, hey, you screwed up because we only had X number of individuals from this particular group join our university or join the tech sector. And I think that's what makes it so hard, right? So I might have a recruiting quota, I might have a quota for the number of people I want in my company, and then if a recruiter can only tap into networks where they're not finding many of those individuals, whose fault is it really? And that's where we get into trouble. And that's honestly why an organization like P33 can be useful in this. We're, we're not in it. We're just kind of outside of it, looking from the outside and trying to make the connections occur so that the interactions within this group are happening in a way that leverage collective wisdom when it's really hard to access that when you're in it. I really like the slide with, um, uh, what is it, the, the hard skills and then being able to communicate and present. Um, I just personally had a feeling about, yes, about uh, just wanting to double down on that, but also if, if you wanted to speak more on that, that and the leaky pipe thing uh, during freshman years of college. Uh, yeah, if you have anything. Yeah, I mean. I appreciate it. Of course. Uh, this is one that I wanted to dive in to the most because I, literally on one side of like my inbox, I had recruiters saying, hey, Alina, get us as much diverse talent as you can. We're desperate for sources. And on the other side of my inbox, I had programs saying, hey, we've got great candidates. Here are their resumes. Please look at them. And I would put them together and I'd be like, this should fit. These are two puzzle pieces that should fit together. Why aren't they? And it's by diving in and getting really specific and kind of tracking those trends that we realized it's the students that had specific, like it's really just those two bullet points of, ah, you did a project. Tell me what that project was. And if, when you can answer that question and say, oh, here was the situation. This was the task I had. Um, this was my role that I played in it, and this is what we accomplished. Brilliant. What sucks frankly, is that students don't get told that. Technical interviews are terrifying. I presume some of you have gone through them yourselves. And that plus all of these communication and these project things, you've not got somebody telling you what to do often, and so you don't know. So like Eric, to your question earlier of like, you were able to prove yourself, that's great. And I'm so happy that you were. Oftentimes, some of the students I chat with don't even know what they put, what to put on their resume. Like, don't even know that they should talk about the fact that they're at Shy Hack Night or that they created this really cool thing on the side. And when they don't know that, they don't present themselves in that light. Similarly, like, if you've never practiced interviewing, it's terrifying. This is my first IRL presentation in a while. My hand is really sweaty. Like, this is not fun. But 
practice makes perfect. There's not a lot of opportunities for it. And frankly, COVID screws everything up, right? Like it becomes so much harder to really understand what's out there when you can't get out there and be in, in it and be exposed to it and start to see it in real life. Most of the job fairs today are virtual. Makes sense. Some of the universities are trying to switch it into being in person again. Really helpful. And also, that's still not the right place to learn about that stuff. That's the right place to make a great first impression. But if you've not got someone tapping you on the shoulder, it's really difficult to figure out what you should be doing. Um, but I can talk about this particular component forever, so please find me afterwards. Yeah, I, kind of, I came here interested in kind of two ends of the pipeline, I guess. One is at our company, um, I, I picked up some interesting tips for that I'll bring back to our engineering manager to uh, improve upon our recruiting and hiring process. But one of the things that he brought into our company is the idea of not closing your candidate pool until you've got the goal. Like our goal isn't to hire X percentage of you know diverse candidates. Our goal is to get a, a pool of people together, and we we don't close our we don't hire until we've got that goal met, which I, it was on a, I don't know if it was data made or somewhere on the job board um, site, I, the, the name of it was a Rooney. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I thought that was an excellent tip. I'm also interested, though, in the other end, and I, I don't know, it doesn't seem like that's part of your talk, is like high school and middle school and uh, getting more kids exposed to and ready for college. Um, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that topic and where I might look into place? Because I, I, I've been trying to, uh, I, I, I volunteered forever in Oak Park where we've got tons of opportunities. Um, so this past year, a, a colleague of mine from work and she and I, we've been uh, all over Austin talking to people, trying to get things started in library and in middle schools and cold calling schools is horrible. and. Um, we finally got a lead in Austin High School, but it, 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 it just seems really hard to get something going. We've got, you know, talents that we want to offer. And, uh, so any thoughts along those lines? Yeah, absolutely. Um, lack of opportunity begets lack of opportunity. So if you're in a situation where as a student you've not been exposed to things or not had the opportunity from the very beginning, what we see is that compounds. And that just gets harder and harder to break through and harder and harder to surpass the older you get. So back to, um, I apologize, I can't remember your name. Samantha's question of what is it that you do to start earlier? There's a lot of great programs out there and they're also not enough because we know that not every high school student, not every middle, middle school student is getting access to that. So there's things like Project Sincere, there's things like Chicago Scholars, um, and then there's a handful of others that I can direct you to that are doing some really great work there. But the point very much still stands that we, at least in these two pilots that we're starting right now, are intervening later. And a lot of the drop off happens way before this even comes into play. I, two closely related questions. Um, you mentioned that when people think about like where they would want to go in the tech world, uh, oftentimes they think of Silicon Valley or New York City or Austin um, and don't think of Chicago as frequently. Um, so I was wondering two, two things on that. One, um, what is sort of your story for putting Chicago more firmly on the map for that? And then the other is, are there similar projects like DEI related uh, initiatives in those cities uh, with findings that you could leverage, that companies here could leverage, or that would leverage things that you've found? Yeah, great question. There's a really great page on this in the report. I think it's page 22, so um, harkening back to that. But what we're trying to do is focus on bringing the story of Chicago tech up there. So oftentimes when you think of Chicago, you think of a lot of the large corporate names that exist, and you don't think of like scrappy, like networking by chance, like money flowing everywhere, like that's not the perspective people have of the city. Part of it's just knowledge. I mean, we had what, 10, maybe 11 unicorns in the last year? That's incredible. That's, that's such great work, and it's all across the spectrum. 
Also, um, when we think about startups, Chicago's not, uh, Chicago's more B2B than it is B2C. And I think that makes a difference in what is on the mind of an every, every, average everyday consumer. Um, so a lot of the work that we do is kind of bringing those names up to light, kind of lifting up the entire Chicago tech scene um, by calling out those CEOs, by calling out those startup founders. Um, you know, we did a trip with Lori Light, Mayor Lori Lightfoot and some uh, key members of her administration over to San Francisco to kind of raise awareness of what Chicago's tech scene looks like and see if that we could use that to kind of leverage the pipeline back into the city. One of the main things that we've seen work well is that cost of living in Chicago in comparison to those other cities that I mentioned, way better. Um, if you're, you know, Midwest, anywhere in this region, Chicago is a great place to be because it's a lot easier to go see your family, a lot easier to get back to your roots if that's what you're interested in. Um, but when people often think of like cutthroat on the edge of tech, we've still not gotten our name right up there. And that's, that's kind of what we're hoping to do. Companies are very bad at interviewing. <laughs> um, the technical interviews suck. They're way outdated. Typically, they have nothing to do with the skills that you need to use in the job. Uh, processes take a long time. People never get back to you after you apply. Um, people don't show up to your interviews sometimes. And there's just so many things that are wrong on companies' side in terms of how they, like, it's like, do you even want people to work for you? Like, are you actually, are you even trying? When are they going to stop being so bad at hiring people? Thank you. <laughs> oh, uh, where do I start with that question? Um, I've never met a recruiter who is a bad person. Every recruiter I know wants to do better. And also, every recruiter I know is stressed out over time, over resource constraint, over the way their system works and the way it doesn't work and all of these things. And that's what I think makes part of this so hard. Right? If I could wave a magic wand and say, like, hey, somebody look at the interview experience of a candidate and tell, like, see what that says about your company, that is part of your brand, I would. Right? Because I've been there, it sucks, it's awful, and everybody knows it. That's not, unfortunately, that's not the, the, that magic wand doesn't exist where you can make that process easier. The thing that I think is most critical that we lose out on in this is the feedback loop. So if you're a candidate applying for a job and you never hear back, you have no chance of improving whatever went wrong the first time. Nobody ever tells you. And in that way, you can't learn. And also, at the same time, recruiters aren't able to tell you what happened because sometimes it doesn't make it through the applicant tracking software. Sometimes it doesn't make it across their desk. Sometimes they bring it to a hiring manager and that hiring manager says this is an unculture fit. And you're left shrugging your shoulders saying, what does that mean? It's a really tough ecosystem out there. And that's why we think getting employers involved early to meet candidates. So it's not just a piece of paper, but it's a person that you know, so that you can see the hunger, you can see their eyes light up when you're talking about tech, when you're talking about their projects. That's what we hope will start to change it. I mean, I'm not silly, I'm not gonna pretend that's gonna magically change the entire world about how all of this works. But I do think relying on true human connection makes a difference. That's kind of what we're trying to do with these projects that we have. And frankly, it's like something that we're going to battle with over and over again. Can you talk a little bit about how like COVID and also the rise of like remote work is impacting all of this? Because on the one hand, it's like I, I hear it. Uh, we're all it's all about Chicago talent, Chicago companies. But like people don't work for Chicago, don't have to work for Chicago companies to be in Chicago and like by the way, pay taxes and like have all the benefit of that person being physically in Chicago, even though they work for some company in California or something like that. Uh, in fact, I've even heard anecdotally from other uh, tech companies in Chicago that a big problem that they're facing now is uh, Chicago companies are competing now in for hiring with 
companies that are in say Silicon Valley with like way more money and can offer super high salaries and like better benefits and all that. Um, and they're like snatching up all the good candidates and there's none left for the Chicago company. So it seems like the barriers of geography don't even like, in some cases, I know it's not for everybody, but especially in tech, it seems that barrier seems like permeable. It's not exactly like look like centered, centered on like a physical location anymore. So I guess, how do you even start to track yeah. all the complexity there? Of, yeah, of that? Uh, we tried. So there is some, some data in the report on it, uh, but effectively everybody's confused. Nobody really knows what's going to happen. So um, what was it? I think overall of everybody we surveyed, 50% said the location of the person is important to them and the other 50% said they did not. So disaggregating that a little bit more, 30% of large corporations said that the location mattered. Uh, sorry, I flipped it. 70% of the comp large corporations said that location mattered. They wanted people to come into the office. 100% of the early startups said, we do not care where you are. Be wherever you are, we just want the top talent. What's also interesting is this survey was conducted in the fall of the most recent fall that we just came out of. Post Delta, pre Omicron, right? So whether or not these companies' policies change is entirely up in the air. So we've heard companies that exactly what you mentioned, like they had the great candidate, they wanted to hire them, a Silicon Valley company offered them 20% higher of a salary and they just couldn't compete. We've had other companies say, because we're Midwest and local, that actually brought more uh, applicants to them because they said, oh, you can come into the office just a few days, and that was an appealing aspect of that position. Frankly, it's a little too soon to tell what the reverberating consequences of all of this will be and you know, so many, so many avenues of life, but I think it'll be something that companies need to grapple with sooner rather than later because what it means to be a good employee is changing and what it means to be an engaged employee is as well. So as a communications person, I'm always sort of curious around like strategy around communicating this message to companies and helping impress upon them the importance of this mission. Um, do you find that there are certain ways that are more effective to kind of persuade or, and I guess, what are those? Yeah, great question. Um, let's see. I think convincing, it, it really depends. So I would say there's companies out there that are really heavy on tech skills, like, like creme de la creme tech skills are necessary right from the get-go. They won't even look at anybody who doesn't have, I don't know, 16 years of Java in them or something like that. Those are the companies that like start with a tech interview before anything else. They don't care about fit. Like if you can code at the level they need you to code, you're in. If not, you're out. That's like one type of mindset. There's another type of mindset that's like, you know what, I have to retrain literally everyone I hire, I don't care. Come in with the right attitude, come in with like an appetite to learn, we'll figure out what we can do with you. There's another mindset that's, this is how we've done it, this is how we will always do it. That mindset irks me the most, just saying, um, but, but that exists. And I think convincing people to do otherwise often frankly, data that they've not had before can make that argument really clear and succinct. So like this page, like I've had companies call me up and be like, 19, Alina, what the hell? And I'm like, yeah, that, that's where we're at in this city, in this state. And I think showing them how dire the situation is truly helps because if we make the argument that there's just 19 and you and however many other companies are battling for those 19 people, nobody's gonna win. Like this is not a sustainable situation. And I think when companies hear that, they start to recognize that they've got to change their behaviors to be a little bit more inclusive, to change up what they do. Because I think like gone are the days of, com my opinion, um, of companies leaning back and saying, ah, the right candidates will surface to the top and they'll come to my door and I don't need to do anything else. I think a lot of companies, even without us nudging them, are starting to recognize that they've got to lean in. They've got to do more than just a job fair. They've got to mentor students, like build connections, really intentionally divest resources into networks that they don't often do um, because that's how you change these things. Everything is effectively a social network. I think everybody knows that. And also 
while knowing it, we still, shoot our, we still trip over it all the time, right? By recognizing that that's the case and kind of owning up to it, it is only by changing that really intentionally that we do things differently. So some companies like have created um, great programs with Chicago State University, a place that they never used to recruit from, specifically to try to change what they do. Um, they go out to boot camps. Um, they have classes on how to do tech interviews because they know how terrible it is. They like really intentionally put their interview process out there so that people know what steps are happening. Um, it's those incremental things that we start to look for for these companies to act different. It's just, I don't know, the, the state of the game at this point. You can't act like you used to and hope that everything works out. Not if you're trying to truly be an equitable company in today's day and age. So thank you for so much for the work you've done in identifying these problems. All these problems are with jobs and um, existing jobs, startups, corporations. Have you looked at um, opportunities to develop, to be the startup, and uh, opportunities for especially young, uh, young coders, young developers uh, to do that? And are there, are there any opportunities there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, remember I was talking about the three pillars of P33 up front. One of those pillars is specifically looking at founders. Um, and so where we've chosen to intervene there, just as a starting point, again, been around for about a year, is by looking at Black and Latinx founders in particular, recognizing that for any startup to succeed, investors typically look for a family and friends round, um, which is that, that startup founder goes to their family and friends and gets some support financially to get things up and running. However, if you're an individual who doesn't have those resources, that's a no-go right from the get-go. And so we've created a pitch competition called Tech Rise. It happens every Friday at noon where we get a panel of judges from esteemed VCs all across the city and other organizations. Um, and every Friday compete for $25,000 among that group of individuals. So Black and Latinx founded, um, either idea stage or pre-seed stage where you're kind of figuring out what you're doing. And what we're trying to do is be that family and friends round. It's not the whole answer, totally. Um, but it's at least us rolling up our sleeves and trying a bit. And honestly, like we just had our finale. We had incredible success in shifting where the dollars flow in this VC ecosystem to be much more diverse than they ever had been before, which is a huge win for our team. Okay, I think we're at time. Thank you, Alina. This is amazing. Thank you, everyone.